Well, welcome back to the Azure podcast. This is episode number 413 being recorded on the 25th of February 2022 with special guest Stephen Kaufman. I'm Sajid and on teams with me we have Cynthia and of course our special guest Stephen who we're going to get to in just a minute. But before that, uh, let's just cover the news from this past week. Not a whole lot, uh, Cynthia, I noticed uh, you had a couple in there and I think I have one that I want to cover. Go ahead. Yeah, so one that is in public preview, there are a number of WordPress enhancements for app service. Now you're able to optimize on things like caching, image compression. Uh, you also have the flexibility to choose amongst a number of different hosting plans. And now I think there are additional configuration that you can use for your WordPress that is deployed on app service. And the other one is the GA of direct enterprise agreement on Azure cost management and billing. So now straight from the Azure portal, you're able to manage a lot of your enterprise agreement or EA roles you're able to create and manage a number of different hierarchy for your enrollment. So you can now split it into different department, account subscription, which will be a lot easier in terms of internal billing, where one EA agreement covers um, a number of different subscriptions that are spread across a number of different departments. You're able to look at properties and policies, and of course, look at all the different usage and charges. And one thing that I think is really interesting is that you're also, be able to view and track uh, Microsoft Azure consumption commitment balance. So that's an agreement that I know, I think we have with a number of different customers. It is usually a commitment you make upfront, but you will still have to go through the consumption of it. So this GA also helps you look at like how close or how far away you are from that commitment. And those are the updates for me. CG, I know you had one around Spring Cloud. Yeah, so Spring Cloud is something that's <clears throat> certainly very near and dear to me. Uh, you know, I have uh, deployed it uh, with uh, some financial services customers and they've been very happy with it. Uh, but this was, uh, I think, uh, last year when they only had the standard tier. So there was just one other thing. There was also a basic tier as well for development. And then there was a standard tier, which offered uh, some level, some number of uh, max number of uh, uh, virtual CPUs and memory for your entire cluster so that you can spin up these uh, Spring Boot applications. And that's really what it's meant for. It's an easy way uh, for customers that have uh, that use Spring Boot uh, in Java today to host it in Azure without having to worry about you know, how, it's, how those apps are built, how they're uh, run, how they're containerized. You know, under the covers, it uses a couple of AKS clusters for you, but you, the customer never sees that. Customer just sees this big, uh, you know, Spring Cloud uh, cluster, and they can just throw applications at it, and it just it just gets built and runs automatically. Uh, so it's really get great from that perspective. It's a great DevOps story for most customers that use it. But one of the things missing has been, you know, getting a good uh, support model for from Spring uh, for the Spring Boot uh, runtime itself. And I think now with the enterprise. Uh, with the enterprise tier of uh, Spring Boot, uh, you can actually get support for, uh, you know, it includes support for Spring. It also, the maximum number of virtual CPUs is 16, and the maximum memory is 32 gigabytes per cluster. So that means you set up one cluster and you can put in as many apps as you can stuff into it, in, into that size. So that's, I think that's something that a lot of customers have been asking for is that support model to be in there in case, you know, Spring Boot application behaves differently in the cloud, right? It, it's kind of uh, leads to some of the topics we're going to talk to Stephen about today, which is you know what uh, you know how you run these applications properly in the cloud. But uh, yeah, so so that's the that's the uh, the round of news for today. And let's turn it over to our special guest Stephen. Stephen, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Please introduce uh, yourselves to our listeners and uh, tell us what you're passionate about in Azure, and we'll take it from there. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much. So my name is Steve Kaufman. I am a chief architect within Microsoft, within the CSU group. And uh, I have been, I've been with Microsoft now for almost 22 years. So it's kind of amazing to think back that it's been that long. Uh, and, and, you know, my journey, uh, I started out with Azure very early on. Uh, you know, it's, before that it was uh, integration. And so when 
you know, the journey to the cloud started, it was all about here's another platform to do integration with, and then quickly moved over to, okay, how do we get all these applications into Azure? And what, you know, how do we do this between more of a lift and shift versus a, a cloud native? And then of course, cloud native blew up. And then what does that really now mean to everybody? And people have different ideas about what that, what that looks like. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm sure your customers uh, just like uh, I am in on a regular basis, and you know, at the even at the CXO level, the word cloud native is thrown about like uh, you know, it's some magical wand or something like that, right? Just wave it over all your applications <laughs> and it's all good. Uh, but uh, you know, how do you when you meet customers? How do you approach this? How do you kind of explain to them you know what they're signing up for when they say they want something that's cloud native especially when it's on azure yes yeah and i think that's it's it's really part of a a, a two part discussion one is are they creating brand new applications you know if we're dealing with a greenfield application then we can really start brand new with cloud native the other part of this is if they've got existing applications they want to keep those applications but rearchitect them and so, you know, then we're kind of recreating them in the cloud, but we're starting from, call it the blueprint or, you know, what they had uh, on premises, but we're taking advantage of the patterns and the services that are in the cloud with a brand new implementation. So that's typically how I have that conversation. What are, what are some of the benefits of, for the second scenario of moving to the cloud, what are some benefits of that migration or re-architecting or re-platforming, modernization, whatever you want to call it, versus um, say like the lift and ship method where you just like take everything and move yep. it to VM? Sure. So so lift and shift, I mean, it's it's faster because you're not making any changes to the, the application. You're just making uh, changes to the infrastructure. And so then I, I can do that you know, a much faster format, but when I start to take advantage of, you know, platform as a service uh, services, I start to remove things from my application that are custom coded. And so now I'm reducing my technical debt. I'm reducing the things that I have to own. I have to test performance to and all the rest of those things. And I can replace them with services that that are there where in, you know, the case of Azure, Microsoft is doing those activities. So, you know, the the speed to get my application built using PaaS services, you know, just just leapfrogs what I could do if I were having to write everything myself. So I think the other is that when you look at the services that are available in Azure, there's just such a wide spectrum of everything from data to IoT to application services to telemetry, you know, everything that you need to run a, a modern application. Yeah, and I think the challenge has always been, uh, you know, we there's all these services that are available out there, and uh, to be able to find out, you know, which of these services has the API or the feature that we need in our application, right? And oftentimes they're hidden. You know, you have to really, you need somebody to go into in, in in depth into each of these services to say, oh yeah, I could use that from there, and I could use that from there and I could take out a whole chunk of code from my application and replace it with that. Uh, but that's, I think, that's where, you know, I think you and your team come in, right, Steve? Or, uh, you guys are the, the the cloud solution architects and you have that that level of depth. But how do you uh, approach it when you come to, when customers say, okay, we've got this existing application, you know, what's, what's it gonna take? Is it gonna be, you know, like a whole one or two year thing? Do we do it side by side? Do we do it in small bits and pieces? Like, you know, what's the kind of general approach there? Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, what is the customer ultimately trying to get to? And are they going to operate, you know, where they've got their existing application on-prem and they're going to do a big bang approach and they say, okay, we are, going to run them side by side for a while, or is this something that you start to take off services or pieces off of the existing application, and you use things like the Strangler pattern to be able to you know, keep what's there, but move pieces over into the cloud. 
And so a lot of it has to get to that business continuity. And how do they continue to do business as they're making this transformation? And so depending on where the customers are in their journey and where they are in their cloud maturity, you tend to have, you know, somewhere on that spectrum. You know, I think the the other piece is, you know, when we look at, uh, at, at customers that are looking to do things brand new, right? So truly cloud native, born in the cloud, you get a little bit more flexibility because you do have that ability to start start small, look at the services, and then build what it is that you are ultimately going to bring to, you know, your customers or into the market. I think you used the word strangler pattern. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit just for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the idea of a strangler pattern is that you've got something that, that's running and, and you're putting a, um, you're, you're tying rope around it, if you will. And that becomes the core of what runs, but anything new or anything you're going to take out of that gets put into the cloud. And you're you're ultimately making that tighter and tighter and tighter. So you have less and less inside of what you've now wrapped that rope around where all the new features are, are now in the cloud in the new environment. And ultimately you've got nothing left in the on-prem. Everything is now in, in the cloud. So within the Azure platform, there are services like AppSource that we talked about or Spring Cloud earlier that they host services. And there are things like APIM that are more integration or logic apps. When you are approaching, say, a scenario, like how do you communicate with your customers on all of these different components? And how do you think about putting different aspects of the platform together? Yeah, no, that. that 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 really becomes an interesting uh, interesting conversation because where do you start? And so for me personally, I tend to start with where are we hosting? What language are we writing in? What environment are we going to be working with? And and so then you know we've got a number of different options for hosting, and whether it's Spring or whether it's a web app or whether it's Kubernetes, right? You've got a whole a whole grouping of these uh, these application hosts. I mean, it might even be that we're we're doing uh, just Azure Functions. So depending on what this application is or what the solution is, we try to figure out which host makes the most amount of sense, what's going to provide the capabilities that's that's needed, and then start to build out from there. How is data going to be handled? What data services do we need? Is it is it one data data source, right? One database. Is it going to be dealing with storage? Is it going to be dealing with an API? And so you start to build out this, this platform. And so we start kind of at the core and then you keep adding on. So whether it's data, whether it's APIM, whether it's you know even a combination, I, I might have a web app that is my core hosting, but then I might have microservices that are running in function apps. And so, you know, how do we start to look at what those requirements are for the application itself and then match which services uh, make sense for for those capabilities? Yeah, one of the at least tenants I've always had to to know that if an application is, you know, kind of ready for cloud for the cloud is it can run anywhere right without having any dependencies right the moment your application says oh, i need a dependency on this file location or this you know drive or or that particular schema or something then you know you you're not cloud ready right yeah. you're not native and so that's like a process i guess you have to go through because i know coming for for developers we're used to that right and we have to kind of throw out all those old ideas from our head uh, and and start off with these new ones uh, born exactly. in the cloud Exactly. You know, I think one of the other pieces when we talk about born in the cloud that becomes so important is, you know, we as developers and as we're starting to look at what the capabilities of the solution are going to be, we tend to look at the functional requirements. When we have an application in the cloud, we have to make sure that we are treating the non-functional requirements at the same level as the functional requirements. I have to make sure that I'm you know, looking at operations, at monitoring, telemetry, security, 
but all of the rest of those things to, to create the full end-to-end -end application. We, we want to make sure that we're not just putting an application into the cloud the same way that we wrote an on-premise application with the same assumptions. So that's the other piece that we have to keep in mind as we're, as we're creating a cloud native application. That's actually a very good point because, I mean, those non-functional requirements did exist on-premises, right? But they were different. Yes. Right. That maybe you use like some kind of a Tivoli software or something for management or, you know, whatever we did on premises. Uh, you may have had a Splunk service for, for logging, for example, and now you move to the cloud and you have to kind of translate that to what makes sense when you move these things to the cloud, right? How do you how do you change those to the correct services out there? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And, and I think the other piece is the process of getting into production. And so that whole DevOps aspect, you know, we, we look at automation. And so how do we take the application, automate the builds, automate the testing, automate the deployment, and make sure that we can do that frequently with as little manual intervention as possible. And, you know, that's another shift from working in an on-prem environment to working into a cloud environment. So when we talk about all of the different Azure services, Yes, we've got all the Azure services for the solution. There's also the Azure services that allow us to do all of that automation and deployment, the tracking, all of the things that come with services like Azure DevOps and GitHub, et cetera. Steve, I'm curious from a performance perspective, can we make the blanket statement that apps will run more performant on the cloud? Or is that a misconception, depending on the specific scenarios? Uh, so very, very good question. Uh, what, what I would say is you have the ability to scale far faster and easier than you did on premises. You know, many organizations, it was hard to get additional capacity. It was hard to get additional servers. And so that took time. You were also trying to deal with scale at your peak point. And then when you weren't operating at peak, you tended to have excess capacity. And in the cloud, you, you use what's, what's needed, right? You can deal with auto scale and, and scale up, scale down. And so when I think about performance, there's the, you know, that, that foundational performance, right? Of being able to throw, you know, all of the, uh, the, the needed requirements from the, the services and the scalability at the application. Um, but you also have all of the tools for doing the individual testing of those uh, of those services. So can I do things in, you know, in a web app that's faster than I might have been able to do it on premises? And the great thing is, is that you have the ability to pick different uh, different tiers of service to be able to meet the performance that you need or to be able to grow as your solution, the number of customers that come in to use your solution grows. And so that process is just a, a, a quicker, easier process. I know Cynthia asked a question early on before we started, so I'll ask it on her behalf. Uh, everyone thinks of uh, cloud native as uh, being related to containers, right? Yeah. Uh, we feel like containers is the catch-all for cloud native. And uh, I don't know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that that containers are, I mean, they're amazing, but they are one tool in the toolbox. And so, you know, when we talk about where do we host the, the solutions, these applications, yes, we've got containers, but we've also got other hosting uh, capabilities within the cloud. And so part of it is making sure that we know what we're trying to, to accomplish. So I don't wanna to have to go set up an entire, uh, you know, Kubernetes containerized environment if what I need are a set of microservices that can run in a functions in, uh, environment. And so part of it is a spectrum of how much control do I need versus, you know, do I just need something that's going to run the code that's going to perform my 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 service, my solution. 
And so Kubernetes for me is part of just that continuum. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, I mentioned Spring Cloud earlier, how, you know, they are blurring the line between containers and non-containers because you actually throw your code at Spring Cloud like it's ordinary Java code, right? You mm -hmm. you just give it, send it in, uh, and it gets built and containerized and uh, put into a Kubernetes cluster and run for you all automatically. And you never see any of that, right? As far as you're concerned, you just threw the code at it. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there are certain advantages to containers, at least, uh, you know, from... Uh, from running it because they're so easy to run on different uh, platforms and Linux, Windows, etc. Uh, so that can be abstracted away. But we all know that dealing with containers um, is 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 not an easy thing, and customers still struggle with that from a day to day basis. They, they do, and and I also want to bring up you know services like container instances, where if I don't need to have the overhead or you know all of the the responsibility of setting up everything for a Kubernetes environment. I can still do something with container instances and essentially put a workload into a you know a single container. And so again, it's it's that spectrum. It's what do I need? And the services are there based on you know those different options. You know, I think one of the things, if I may, that you know, we talked earlier about, you know, how do you know or how do you pick which services based on you know what's the requirement? And one of the things that I also talk to customers about is the, uh, the, the, the guidance and all of the, the information from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And so they have a, uh, a tool map. And so you can go into that tool map and get a really good idea of all of the different tools based on what category they're in. And so then you also have an idea of, okay, here are the categories I should be thinking of. Now, the, the CNCF does have a lot of, um, I'll say, focus on containers, on Kubernetes. And so that's just one thing if you, you know, if you do go take a look at the, the material that's there, is you know, just know that that is one view that's focused on containers rather than that spectrum of, uh, of, of hosting. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so if, uh, you know, Cynthia, do we have any, uh, any more questions for Steve? I think this has been a really uh, good uh, refresher on cloud native. I know we had uh, Robert Vetter on uh, uh, maybe a year or so ago, maybe it seems, feels like longer. Mm -hmm. uh, he ta also talked about it, but I think you you know you brought a nice uh, new modern uh, perspective to it. So uh, yeah. appreciate your your perspectives here. Uh, Cynthia, anything else for Steve? No, oh, thanks for the discussion. It's been really enlightening. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Steve.